Okay, let's do this. My name is Nyunfin Wantarazafnatanj. I have a Malagasy name, so one could say that I am from Madagascar, or best known as Madagascar. But not the I like to move it, move it, <laughs> animated movie. <laughs> but the fourth largest island in the world. It's located on the African continent. Growing up in Madagascar also taught me that I was not just growing up in a poor country. I never felt poor, and that's because my country's GDP never defined me. I also got to call multiple places home, and as an immigrant, it wasn't always easy, adjusting to different cultures and languages. At times, it was tiring trying to educate other people about myself, but it is necessary if we want other people to appreciate us as our authentic self. Growing up in Madagascar also meant that money was necessary for survival, but you don't need money to be happy. Instead, something that we value deeply is the love for our cultures and our community. Something we hold on to dearly is called fiavanan, and fiavanana is, can be translated as how we take care of the members of our society, regardless of who they are. I grew up in a very proud Malagasy family, but we lost part of our cultural identity during the French colonization. It was important for my grandparents and mostly my grandma that I never forget who I am, the land that raised me, and mostly my luva. Luva can be translated as heritage. So when it was time for me to go abroad to study, she would perform a ritual for me that was called Tsujan. Tsujan is blessings. And when you send someone off, a lot of different tribes would perform this in different ways. But my grandma did it this way. She would grab a bowl of water, she would bless it, and she would have me turn my back on her. And she would throw the water at me as she would ask the ancestors to guide my way and wish me well on my journey. That was powerful. That gave me so much strength. It kept me grounded. And it reminded me that no matter how far I go and wherever I am in life, they might not be there physically, but they're right here in my heart. But I want you to understand that as much as she did that over and over over the years, it strengthened me and made me so much proud about being Malagasy. But as much as I, I come here and I started and I told you I'm from Madagascar, I am more than someone from Madagascar. I need us to remember that as we are educating people about our authentic self, we can be lost in translation about being a single story. And we are not. We are rather layers of multiple stories. At 12, I told my parents, one day I'll move to Boston, in Madagascar. <laughs> and I eventually did. I came here to do my undergrad at Berklee College of Music. And because I made it my career, one could say that maybe I dreamt about being a singer, and that was my dream school. But I didn't. I was actually a point guard for a long time, and Rondo was my favorite player. And he played for the Celtics at the time. And I wanted to move here because I wanted to be a pro basketball player. <laughs> I know, I'm five feet tall. <laughs> it's clearly not the story you were expecting. But every time I step into the TD Garden, I would get a little emotional because now I get to call it my home team. But my love for basketball, it started at home. My dad would take us to a nearby court every other Sunday after church, and we would play with my cousins and my brother. I told him I wanted to take basketball seriously, and that was before the time I was really trying out for a team. And up to that point, they were shielding me from all the physical contact from the game and what it's like to really be on court. 
But this was the time, and this is one of my favorite ch uh, childhood memory of my dad because this is one of the most defining moments of my life. It was the first time I'm going to play one-on-one -on -one against my dad. But my mindset was, this is still my routine. I'm going to have it my way, so I'm going to win. But he's just going to set up the stage for me to win. I'm on defense, though, and he's going for his layup. He's going for his layup, and clearly I'm unguarded because I think this is just my regular routine. He goes for his layup, and I fell. Obviously, because I wasn't grounded. I fell, and I got hurt. But I wasn't hurt physically. I barely had scratches. I got hurt because I expected my dad, A, to keep making me shine the way he does, and B, because I thought that my dad was supposed to be my protector and wherever I am in my life, it should always do that. So my comfort zone was broken. So I went on the sideline, picked myself back up, and started crying. I crossed my arm, and I didn't want to step back in again. I looked at my mom, trying to send some comfort. And my mom, if you know anything about African mothers, they can tell a lot with their looks. She just looked at me, and she gave me the look of, that's you and dad's business. I must stay out of it. <laughs> and my dad, because I expected him to come and hug me or something, he didn't. He stood there and he looked at me and he said, if you want to become a good point guard or even anybody one day, you've got to step back in here and keep trying until you maybe win. Otherwise, it also gave me the option of we can go back home and you don't have to deal with basketball again. I liked a good challenge. So I stepped back in and kept trying. But what my dad was telling, like teaching me then is resilience, because I have applied that in all areas of my life up to this day. What my dad did, he didn't hurt me. He knew that I needed to be uncomfortable. Because what happened for us when we get too comfortable in our comfort zone is that we assume that the people around us and the world is going to give us the same grace that the people who love us would. But the world isn't like that. My dad knew that it wasn't just a matter of helping me navigate my way on the basketball court. He knew that life would bump into me, and I will fall, and maybe I will cry. But I have to step back in again and keep trying and trying. Because my story doesn't end up where I fall. My story, and I can change my narrative by stepping back in and in again. So that the challenges that we've life, mainly as a woman of color, me being put in a box was up to me to change my narrative. It's important to educate people as we are trying to educate them to appreciate us as our authentic self. So showing up is one thing. Keep trying and stepping into the court in order for you to be your authentic self and the person you should become. But it's important to also voice and tell your story. A lot of us don't, and we let a lot of things slide. But in order to feel heard and seen, we need to start speaking. We cannot just assume that people get us just because we tell them one thing. Because remember, we are layers of stories. So let's go back to my name. My name is Nyun Finwan Chadazafnatan. I know it sounds like a sentence, and it is. It actually means something. It sounds melodic. Nyun Finwan Chadazafnatan. I took my stage name out of it, and I called myself Niu Raza. What people don't know is actually Niu is how people know me, but that's how my parents called me first. That's my nickname at home. Niu is a derivative of Nyun. N-Y-O-N-Y. -N -Y. But because it's spelled differently than it's written, it's been butchered multiple times already before it was butchered at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was in college, a lot of my college friends would call me Neoni. And to be fair, because I was explaining at the beginning, we suffered from a deep cultural identity, and we rejected our own for a long time. 
when people gave me the opportunity to have a different name and they called me Neoni. I jumped on it and I even introduced myself as Neoni at some point. What I didn't know is that I was disrespecting my entire culture by allowing people to disrespect me like that. But that didn't hit me until my mom came here from my graduation and I pre presented her to my friends and I was so excited. And my friend would say, it's so nice to meet Neoni's mother. And she, here she comes with the look again. She just looked at me, and not because she was disappointed from meeting my friends. She was disappointed because my name mean, meant something. And that made me realize, Niun means the river. Niun came from my mother's middle name. And my parents didn't give me a Western name because they were reclaiming their story through me. So I started educating people and actually taking the time to show and taking the time to tell. So today, we're going to learn how to say my name. <laughs> and I figured out a fun way to do it. You can look at both your knees, and then there is a U in between. So there's one knee, there's a U, and knee. So knee, you, me. Can you say after me? Perfect. Now, I'm going to teach you how to call someone across the street in my culture. You would say the first name and then you add a long A ah at the end. Okay? So it's going to be ni, you, ni. Ah, okay? Can we try it? It's okay. It's a safe space, I think. We've already <laughs> gone through so many people already. I think we can do this together. So ni, you, ni, ah, okay? And. No, but imagine that I'm actually at the other side of the street. I don't think if you're like downstairs in the bottom of the room and you're trying to call me upstairs, that's how you're going to say it. I don't think your children will hear you. So we can, let's do that one more time. And you yes, so that's exactly how my mom calls me when I'm about to be in trouble. <laughs> my point is belonging is not about us fitting in us trying to sacrifice pieces of ourselves to feel safe in a space. Belonging is you starting being authentically yourself. You creating this space for you. It's a feeling you create. And what I just did, I just, right here right now, I became home, right back where my, my parents' house is. Belonging starts with you, each and every one of you. So because we let a lot of things slide in our everyday life. We need to start reclaiming our story. And that starts with you. Thank you.